Having planted Hope Fellowship 19 years ago, it is a joy for me to get to help other church planters start their church. And over the last few years, Tribes Church in Argyle with Gavin Pappett, and this year, I am so excited to partner with Josh and Summer Wright and Dallas City Church. Over the last few months, I've asked you to give towards our fearless campaign that's ending the end of December. Thank you so much for your giving. And I'm asking you, let's end this thing well so that Dow City Church and even other church plants like this can happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. Well, hi, I want to welcome everyone with us at our McKinney campus, our Frisco West campus, everyone watching online, including my sons, Liam and Beckett. Hey, guys, and everyone here with us at Frisco East. Uh, We're going to conclude a series today that we kind of left off in November called Amen. And the series is about prayer, and it's prayers that God would say yes or amen or so be it. Too. But before we jump into that, I just want to say that they told me the, the little uh, kind of title slide under uh, the image when I came on the screen said Josh Wright, lead pastor, Dallas City Church. And, and I kind of got a little emotional, to be honest, because for eight years it said Josh Wright, student pastor at Hope Fellowship or next gen pastor at Hope Fellowship. And I, I can't tell you as I have gone all, all across the country or just hang out with friends or family or even been out in the community, how proud I have been to be able to say that that's what I get to do. The joy that I have had and my family has had being a part of Hope Fellowship, uh, we are eternally grateful to you as a church, to our staff, to John and Melissa and our leaders. We, we just are uh, just in love with this church and has been literally the joy of our life. Um, And now as we go uh, to plant Dallas City Church, we are terrified, um, but so excited uh, because we know that you're praying for us and we feel your support. And I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for the past eight years that I've been able to say that I'm a part of Hope Fellowship and hopefully we'll get to say that for the rest of my life as we partner together as two churches reaching now one area for Jesus, amen? Okay, so we're gonna jump into the Lord's Prayer as we wrap up 2018. And a lot of prayers happen this time of year. Kids have prayed over the past few weeks leading into Christmas that the right presence would be under the tree. And I hope kids that those prayers were answered. If they weren't answered, talk to your parents. They know why, they'll tell you, it'll be fun. Um, people have prayed for the stock market in the past few weeks. It's been a little crazy. We've had a lot, there have been a lot of people praying for the stock market, a lot of interest there. Uh, we've prayed for the nation of Indonesia recently as they've experienced a devastating earthquake uh, as a result of a volcano and hundreds of people have lost their lives, literally families displaced. And uh, it's just been a terrible time in that nation. So we prayed for Indonesia um, on a lighter note, particularly in our area, we, we tend to pray some of the, some ritualistic prayers around this time of year. Every single year, some bow on their knees in reverence, some lay on the, the floor, prostrate before God as if to say, you're in control and we need you as we pray for our Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, we pray this prayer every year that this would be the year, you know. In fact, the comedian, uh, theologian, uh, philosopher, but really he's a comedian, uh, probably the other things too, not, not judging, but a guy named Dimitri Martin says that more prayers are prayed at sporting events than all other places combined. I tend to agree, actually. I really do, because think about it. You know, we pray, we're, at a, we're, we're watching a game, we're at a game, we play. God, please let him make the shot. God, please let him miss the shot. God, please let him hit the ball. God, please let him miss the ball. God, please let her score the goal. God, please let her miss the goal. What do you do if you're God? What if there's a Christian on both sides? You gotta be a little, like, conflicted, right? How do you answer that prayer? I don't know. I don't know if you do or not. I can testify to this whole sporting event theory because I wasn't raised a Christ follower. Our our, uh, family didn't go to church. My mom was a single mom. She worked. And really Christianity and the Bible and church wasn't a part of our lives. But I did grow up playing high school football and high school basketball in a small town in Alabama. And I will tell you this, Christian or not, before every game, you're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. (laughs) 
<laughs> you're going to gather together, the coach is going to give some kind of talk, and then you're going to circle around. And they didn't ask you if you even believed in said Lord. I did not know there was a Lord, and I prayed the Lord's Prayer. Um, and you'd gather around and you'd mumble the words, Father in heaven, the kingdom come, will be done in in Jesus' name, amen, go Tigers. That's how we always ended our prayer because we were the Tigers. I, I didn't know how to pray, but I knew the Lord's Prayer. In fact, the Lord's Prayer are the most commonly used and most used collection of words in the history of the English language. More people have said these words than any other phrase, any other expression of the English language in the history of the world. So these are very, very, very familiar words but maybe not so much understood words. So I want us to back up a little bit and understand that when we talk about prayer, we're not talking about formulas. It's not one plus one equals two, and so God has to do what I want him to do. That's not how prayer works. In fact, I've experienced it to be almost the opposite in my life. The shortest distance between two places with God is often five or six turns in 10 or 12 years along the way. Because he's more concerned with me becoming like Christ. He's more concerned with his kingdom and his will. He's more concerned with the people around me and the development of of Christ's likeness in me than he is in me getting to where I want to be as quick as I want to be there because I want to be everywhere and I want to be there quick. And so I've learned that prayer is not a formula. It's a lens. Prayer is a way of seeing things the way they really are And even better, seeing things as they could be. Prayer is an ordering of the world. Now, to understand the Lord's Prayer specifically a little better, let's zoom back a few thousand years in history. Because Jesus taught this prayer in Israel around 2,000 years ago. Let's zoom back 1,500 years before that to Egypt. To to the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus, written by Moses, the first five books of uh, of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch or the Torah or the law. But most of these books are written around creation and then the subsequent uh, blessing of Abraham, the promise of the nation of Israel, and then that nation becoming prisoners and slaves in Egypt. Those people being subject to Pharaoh and his rule And they prayed as they had no freedom. Their lives were being taken for them. They were essentially uh, made to be machines that just produced bricks for the Egyptian government. And so they prayed. They prayed that God would deliver them. And so God took a man named Moses up onto a mountain. If you were here at our Christmas Eve services, you heard John talk about the burning bush and God spoke. And it's very interesting the first thing that God said to Moses. God said, I have heard the cries of my people. I love that God addresses this global issue this way, that I am a God who hears. I'm not a God who's unconcerned and distant. I'm a God who hears the prayers of my people. And so God uh, used Moses and his brother Aaron, and they delivered the people out of Egypt through the Red Sea into what would be the promised land or, or the, the territory that is now the nation of Israel. And so along the way, these people had to figure out how to do life. Egypt was their provider. So they had no food. So they prayed for food. And God caused manna, which is kind of like an unleavened flatbread, and quail to fall from the sky every day, as if to say, you can trust me every day to meet your needs. Then they had, they had absolutely no place to worship. They had no place to offer sacrifices, no place to pray, no place to offer uh, uh, offerings to God and sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins, the sins of their nation, the sins of their family, no place to be made right with each other through religious practice or ritual. And so God instructed Moses and his brothers and a group of men called Levites to build what's called the tent of meeting, which is kind of like a portable church, a tabernacle, if you will, that everywhere they went, this tent would go. And that would be the place they would go and offer sacrifices and offerings for forgiveness, for pardon with both God and, and both uh, and man. They had no direction 
God just took them through the, the Red Sea and pointed them north, northeast, but they didn't know how to get to this promised land. And so they prayed for direction and asked God to lead them. And Moses said, God, I won't go unless you go before us. And so God offered a cloud by day that would move. And when the cloud moved, they would move. And then he offered a pillar of fire and smoke at night. And when the, the fire would move, they would move. And the last thing, they had no moral kind of, kind of uh, agreed upon sense of ethic or morality. Because for years, 400 years, they had been under the tyranny of Egypt. And in Egypt, power equaled right. So if I had power over you, it didn't matter what you wanted. If, it, if I had authority over you as an Egyptian, it didn't matter what you needed. What mattered what, was what I wanted. I could take your property. I could take your family. I could take your land. Because it was kind of Darwinianism before Darwin was ever alive. Survival of the fittest. And the fittest were the Egyptians. So they had this whole culture that was built around Egyptian rule and supremacy, this entire culture and way of doing life that was built around the worship of Egyptian gods. And for 400 years, the Hebrew people, God's people, had been subject to this culture. And so they get out into the wilderness and they, how do we live? How do we treat each other? Do we act the way that we've been acting for the past 400 years? Do we do what we saw them do? Do we worship the way that they worshiped? How do we order our world? It's a huge question. Because we understand the way that the world was ordered. But God brought us out of that world. And so if God brought us out of that world, there must be something wrong with the way that that world is ordered. The system is there, but the system is broken. And now we're looking to God for a new system, a new way of ordering our world. I'd, I'd ask myself this question at, at 17. I became a Christ follower. Like I said, I'd never read a Bible. I hadn't gone to church. And I grew up in a home with, um, for the most of my childhood, my mom was single, but a handful of relationships and guys in her life, a couple of uh, marriages that had failed. And at the time when I was 17, she was married to a man who was an alcoholic. He was abusive. He, he was very angry, just full of anger because his father was an, a traveling evangelist. And they'd found out that his father, all the years that he preached across the country, had cheated on his mom. And they were furious. And they never forgave him, and they were angry. And his dad died before they were able to make it right. And so he decided he would never step foot in the, in, in the doors of a church again. When he found out this information, he was in seminary on his way to become a pastor, quit seminary, joined the army, went to Japan, and said, I'm done with God. And he took his frustration out on his family and the people around him and his employees. And, and here I am in the midst of this at home. I'm in small town Alabama, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know where you're at with this, but in small town Alabama, the reality is that racism wasn't just systemic. It's obvious and clear, and it was all around me. And I, I had to watch this. I saw this happen all around me, and this was the ordering of a lot of the world around me. I lived in an area that wasn't uh, very prosperous. There's a lot of poverty. We grew up on, on a, a lot of times in our life on food stamps and on what local churches could provide or family members for us. And so there was this system that I was placed and I was born into this time and this family and this world. And I became a Christ follower and I had to ask myself the question, do I order my world that way or is there something different? Do, do I continue with the traditions that I've learned? Do I continue with what, what I've been brought, uh, 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 brought up around or subjected to? Or can it be different? Could it be different? And that is the hope of prayer. That is the hope of looking through the lens of what could be if God were to move in our lives. It's a way to live outside of the old, broken systems. It's about a new ordering of your world. So there's creation in the beginning in Genesis, and there's an ordering of the world. And then sin enters, and it causes the world to be reordered and disoriented, and there's chaos, and God orders the world in a new way. 
And then there's the people of Israel and there's Egypt and the Exodus and they move out and this new creation called Israel, this new nation is formed and there's a new ordering of the world as they decided to live according to God's principles and God's laws and God's commands. There's these rituals, these tabernacles, there's, uh, there's these sacrifices and there's peace and there's shalom. Fast forward 1500 years. There's another ordering of the world. Now it's not Egypt, it's Rome, it's not Pharaoh, it's Caesar. And it's not a sacrificial lamb on the altar in a moving tent. It's the sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world on a Roman cross. There's a new lamb, and instead of a new creation being a a, a nation called Israel, there's a new creation in the hearts of men and women who decide to submit their lives to Jesus Christ, confess that he's Lord, believe that God raised them from the dead, and Paul says all things become new and old things pass in those people's lives. The new creation isn't a nation anymore. It's a people who've been made new and renewed by God. And and those people are faced with that same question. Now, how do we orient our lives? In Leviticus, Moses is teaching them how to order their world. And in the Gospels, Jesus is doing the same thing. So we get to Luke chapter one. And the disciples have been following Jesus, watching him as he taught, watching him as he interacted with people, but also watching him as he prayed. When Jesus prayed, like really cool things happened. Blind eyes were open. People who couldn't walk began to walk. A a Roman guard's daughter had died and Jesus prayed for her and she came back to life. Like a Long John Silver's breakfast, uh, lunch from a little boy fed 5,000 people. Like really cool things happened when Jesus prayed. And so the disciples watched and they did what you and I would do. They go to Jesus as you see somebody who does something really, really well and you wanna know more, they say, Lord, Teach us to pray in Luke chapter 11, verse one. Now this is super encouraging to me because this means that prayer can be learned. I, I don't know what it is, uh, but, but we ha- somehow think that just some people are just natural prayers. You know, they're just better than others. Like if, you're, if he's a pastor, then he must know how to pray better because he's just a better prayer. And then it, it, here's the thing, that may be true. Maybe some people have a, a proclivity to speak out loud better, or maybe they've been around prayer more or grew up around prayer more. But the reality is that they're asking Jesus to teach them how to pray because prayer is something that can be taught. Prayer is something that can be learned. So I, I've tried something new in my life over, the, over 2018. Um, when I'm at a restaurant and a server comes and brings my meal, I'll always stop them and say, hey, I'm a pastor in the area and I'm about to pray over this food. Is there anything I could pray for you about as I pray? A, a couple months ago, I was having breakfast with a, a man in Little Elm and the server came and she stopped for a moment She caught her breath and she said, actually, today, when I get off work, I'm going to file divorce papers. I'm gonna raise my son by myself and I have no idea what to do. Before she came to work that day, her thought was, I'm alone in this. No one sees, no one's with me, I'm by myself. How am I gonna do this? And in a prayer at a lunch, God reoriented her world and said, you are not alone, I hear you, I see you. And I invited her to church and said, look, you don't have to go through this by yourself. We don't know you, but we wanna get to know you and we're right down the road. Come anytime you want, anything we could ever do for you, we'd gladly do. You are not in this by yourself. Wow. Just a simple prayer totally changed the lens with which she saw the most devastating event that had happened in her life. Now, here's what I know. Here's what I know. There are a lot of people in your life that you'll meet that'll tell you they're incredible golfers. Most of them are lying. There are a lot of people who tell you, oh, I'm great with money. I really understand the stock market. How's that going for you for the past three or four weeks, right? There are a lot of people who tell you, oh, I'm a really good this, I'm a really good that. I have yet to meet anybody who says, you know what I'm great at? Prayer. I am an amazing prayer. You should hear me pray. In fact, come to my house and let me show you all the trophies I got. Best prayer in sixth grade. Like, nobody's great at this, but it's essential. 
It's essential. This ought to be freeing. For most of us, it's kind of mysterious. It's difficult. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll be praying and then I'll forget I'm even praying. You know, the phone rings, the kids are being kids. You know, life, life happens. It's, it's not, not to mention the understanding of it all, the comprehension of it all. It's not something that we're just amazing at, yet nine out of 10 Americans say they pray. That's, it's incredible. The reason we pray is because we need a space for our joy. We need a place to express our gratitude. I've, I've heard people say this. I just thank the universe for this house. We, we, even if we're, we're not a Christ follower or even believe in God, people need a place to express their joy. We need a place to express our anxieties and our fears. We need a place when we feel the need for justice, when we need to blame somebody for something, because we like blaming people for things. When we need to blame someone, we need to, to feel that there's a sense of justice in the universe. It wouldn't be complete without it. And so we need this place of Prayer And Jesus would teach them some incredible things about how to offer up these fears and anxieties and joys and justice and blame and stress. He would say this in Matthew chapter six. Well, then pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love how Jesus front loads this prayer. He doesn't say, well, gosh, you guys have so many needs. You, you're so weak. You just have such little faith. You're always bothering God with all the trite things. In your, like he doesn't talk about uh, our shame. You should be grateful that you even get to talk to God and that you even get to pray. He doesn't do any of that. There's no shame or guilt here. In fact, he doesn't even front load this prayer with anything about us at all. He front loads this prayer by saying, here's where your attention needs to go. It needs to go to God because you need to understand who you're talking to before you, you begin to present your requests. And so here's how he breaks down this prayer. He says, our Father in heaven. I love that he uses the word our because the word our means we belong to a people. Christianity is a private decision, but it is a public lifestyle. It is a corporate discipline. It is not something that is meant to be done alone. And Jesus recognizes this. He says, listen, when you pray, know that you're not the only one. You're not in this by yourself. You're not the only one that's faced this. There are others who, are, who have gone before you or even who may be around you right now who are dealing with what you're dealing with right now all over the world, there are people praying our Father. And so Jesus says, you belong to a people. We are the most connected people in the history of the world, yet we're the loneliest. And Jesus says the antidote to that is to understand that church is not a place to go to, it's a people to belong to. Wow. It's not a building, it's a people. And so Jesus says, pray then our Father, there's some solidarity in that. There's some, I, I'm not alone in that. Our Father, I love that he uses the word Father. He actually uses the word Dad, which is a very personal word, a very intimate word. It's not some distant kind of Father by, by name only or by genetics only. It's actually a, a, a Father who is, who is concerned about the details of your life, a Father with whom you have audience in the present moment. A father who cares about what you are saying and about to say. Have you ever been with someone at a lunch or in a meeting and you're talking and you're just kind of sharing some important things and their phone rings and they pull out their cell phone and they start talking and they're like, yeah, oh my goodness, wow. Hey, hold on, you really matter to me, but I gotta, I gotta take this call. Yeah, oh my goodness. Well, here's what I want you to do. Fire that guy, he's dumb. But listen, I, I'm, re I'm with you, okay? Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Why are we blah, blah, blah. Don't you wanna take their phone, put it on a tee and use a driver and knock it down the fairway? It drives me bananas. Nothing shows me you could care less about me than when you do that. Here's the thing. God doesn't have to send an email when you're praying. 
He doesn't have another report to fill out. There's nobody more important. There's nobody that requires his time more. There's, there's, there's not anything else on his schedule. He's wiped the whole thing clear. And all it says is your name in that moment. You have full audience with a father who cares for you and what you're about to say and who you are. And then he says something neat. He says, our father in heaven. As if to say, this is not just some father who can't do about anything about anything. My dad can't control the stock market. My dad can't heal my physical body when I'm sick. My dad can't do anything about the earthquake and, and, and tsunami in Indonesia on a grand scale. My dad can't do anything about Dallas City Church and what, what we wanna see God do in Dallas. But my father in heaven, now my father in heaven, with him all things are possible. My father in heaven holds the universe in the span of his hands. And in the moment that I open my mouth and pray to him, in that moment, I have the attention of the almighty God who is big enough to create the entire universe, but small enough to be present with me in a moment. Wow. In your car, in the bathroom, getting ready in the morning with one kid on one leg and one kid screaming in the other room in traffic, in the doctor's office as you wait, the diagnosis, driving away from the funeral home as you're trying to figure out how to do life without this person, sitting at the table, deciding who gets what in the divorce. God is with you. God is with you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, we don't hallow a lot. I I haven't heard that word a lot, but the word hallow means may your name be kept holy. It means to praise. It means to exalt. And and so I want to address something uh, today that has been happening in our world, particularly uh, the United States, that I, as a spiritual leader, uh, just feel like has got to be said. I I just think we can't go on anymore. It's an elephant in the room and, um, you know, I'm going to pastor a church in Dallas, so what are they gonna do, fire me? Um, Just joking. (laughs) But but there's this heresy that's going around and it's, it's really bothering me. There are people among us who would make the bold claim that a man named LeBron James is the greatest basketball player that ever lived. Heresy. This is terrible, terrible teaching. He's a good basketball player, but there is only one man who played in six finals and never lost. The only one man. There is only one man who's called Mike, Michael, Mike, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, your heirness, heir Jordan. There is only one man whom which we say, I don't wanna be like LeBron, I wanna be like Mike. There's only one greatest player in the history of basketball. His name's not LeBron James. It's Michael Jordan, and it settles it because I'm a preacher. Amen. (laughs) Now, what do we just do? We hallowed. Now, it'd be really good if you learned to hallow your kids. It'd be really awesome if you learned to hallow your spouse. But it'd change your life if you learned to hallow God. God, you're amazing. The mountains melt like wax before you. The hills tremble at your presence. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love for us. You are the God who who was and is and is to come. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. With man, things are impossible, but with you, all things are possible. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us. You are the God that changes not the same yesterday, today, forever. We hallow your name and praise your name. We hallow his name. Here's the gift of front-loading your prayers by focusing on who God is. It's the gift, and don't miss this, it's the gift of peace. Because here's what what it's saying. It's saying there is one throne in heaven and I am not responsible to sit on it. The whole thing doesn't depend on me. It's not all on my shoulders. I'm raising these kids alone, but I'm not raising them alone. Do you see? 
I'm, I'm, I'm starting this business alone, but I'm not starting it alone. I'm going through this season alone, but I'm not going through it alone because there is a God in heaven who hears my prayers. He is my father. He is mighty. He sits on the throne and he is deeply concerned with my life. It gives you peace when you right-size God that way in light of everything else you face. So Jesus says, before you bring me your prayers and before you bring me your, your needs and the things around you, what I want you to do is I want you to front load this with who God is. Remember who you're talking to and it'll bring so much peace in your life because it's not all dependent on you. You know, when you're older, you pray for things that you didn't pray for when you were younger. I find myself praying so much for peace these days as I have two sons in my house that are three and one. God, bring me peace. Lord, do something with these kids. I'm not in it alone. I can parent well, but it's him who speaks to their hearts. He is in control. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This prayer is more about his kingdom than it is my kingdom. It's, it's saying, God, I'm more committed to your will than my own. Andy Stanley said it this way, the purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not impose it. It's to say, God, I'm gonna bring you some things around me that I need or things that I'm noticing. I'm gonna present my requests in just a moment, but I want you to understand that before I ask you for anything, my knee's bent to you. You can say no. You can direct me in a different way. God, you have the authority. Your will trumps my will. Your kingdom trumps my kingdom. Your will is better and bigger and more full of joy and peace than the ordering of the world around me. So I'm submitted to that. I'm submitted to you. So before I ask you for anything, I just want you to know, whatever the answer is, God, I'm submitted to that. Whatever you require of me is what I will do. A, a friend of mine said it this way one day. He said, don't pray a prayer that you're unwilling to be the answer to or act on. So for me, as I prayed in 2018, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I took the word earth out and I put the word Dallas in. And the reason I did that is because I found out that there are more than 1.3 million people in Dallas and of those who call themselves millennials, only 29% of them are a part of a Christian community of believers. There are 100 teenagers who slept on the streets in Dallas last night. There's 115,000 kids who live below the poverty line in the city of Dallas. There's 4,000 homeless people in Dallas. There's 1.7 million people projected to move in addition to the 1.3 that are already there into the city in the next 30 years and all of these numbers can be changed and transformed and impacted by the local church, which is the hope of the world. And so as I prayed this prayer, I prayed, God, your kingdom come, your will be done in Dallas as it is in heaven. I believe that. I believe that can happen. And so God has called us as a family to go and start Dallas City Church in 2019. As long as there's a breath in my lungs, as long as there's light in my eyes, I will believe that God wants to do something great in that city. And so I'd love to invite you to hear more about what we're doing in Dallas on uh, January 20, 20th at our Frisco East campus. All of you uh, watching at our campuses and online are invited. Uh, we'll be having an interest meeting at our Frisco East campus, North Hall Auditorium. It's a Sunday from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, child care will be provided. There'll be light refreshments and coffee. But if you just wanna come and hear more about our vision and what we're doing, maybe you wanna hear more about what it would mean to be a part of our church uh, and what God's doing in Dallas, or, uh, or you just want more information, we'd love to meet you. You can go on our website, dallascitychurch.com slash events and sign up. If you're bringing your family, make sure you uh, request child care on there. But but this is, this is our family's way of saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done, and now I'm actually gonna do something about it. So as you look around your world, what a great way to respond to this prayer by saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? Where in my life? Where in your life? Where in your world? And then, God, how can I respond? So Jesus wraps up the prayer this way. He says, give us this day our daily bread. In Egypt, 
on the way to Israel, they had no bread, they had no manna, and God provided. So Jesus is saying, pray the, pray the same prayer. God provided then, he'll provide now. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. They had no place uh, to offer their sacrifices, to be forgiven by God or to forgive each other. And so God provided a, a, a tabernacle to sacrifice animals, lambs and goats in order to be forgiven and to forgive. And Jesus is saying, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And he's speaking about him being the sacrificial lamb. And because he's forgiven us now, we have the power and the responsibility to forgive others. And and on the way to the promised land, they had no direction. They didn't know know the way to go. And 1,500 years later, Jesus would say, when you pray, pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, if you take the journey of the people of Israel and what God did for them, and you lay it on top of the Lord's prayer, it's almost a template. It's almost the exact same thing. It's ordering the world in a different way around God's authority, around God's way of, do, of, of, of uh, that the world should be, of what could be by faith. It's trusting God daily for provision. It's trusting God to forgive you and to give you strength to forgive others. It's trusting God to lead you and to show you in your life where could his kingdom come. In other words, there's a new way to order your world around his kingdom, his will, recognizing that he's on the throne. And if he can do it in Egypt, he can do it in Rome. And if he did it in Rome, he can do it in your life. If he did it in your life, he can do it in my life. If he can do it in my life, he can do it in Dallas. And if he can do it in Dallas, he can do it in Prosper and Frisco and McKinney and Little Elm and Salina and every area around us. This God who heard all the way back in Exodus also heard all the way back in Genesis uh, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Here's today. The prayer is the same. The principles are the same. God hears. God responds. God can be trusted. There is a new way of ordering the world on earth as it is in heaven. So let me offer you a prayer for 2019 as we close. Maybe you'd pray the Lord's Prayer every day. Maybe at your meals with your family, you'd pray the Lord's Prayer as a new way of praying at, at your meals. But when you get to the part that says your kingdom come, your will be done, I wanna, I wanna challenge you to make it personal in that moment as we made it personal. As we prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done in Dallas. God, would you heal marriages in Dallas? God, would you lead millennials to yourself in Dallas? God, would you, would you get people off the streets and into homes in Dallas? Would you feed the hungry in Dallas? Would you restore families in Dallas? As we pray this about Dallas, where is it for you that needs order? Where is there chaos? Where is there disorder? Where is there a chance for the kingdom to come in your life as it is in heaven? God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my marriage as it is in heaven. God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my finances. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my kids' lives, in my business, in Prosper, in my city, in my school. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my physical body this year. God, I'm asking you to move. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my prayer life, my spiritual disciplines. God, I wanna draw closer to you. And know that as you pray this prayer, before you get to this part, you're saying, God, and I'm choosing to align myself to your will. So whatever that means, when I pray your kingdom come, your will be done in my marriage, it may mean that I might have to work on it a little bit. It may mean that I might have to to trust you to help me forgive. God, your kingdom come, your will be done in my finances. It may mean that there might need, need to be a new ordering of how you do your financial life. So long before we get to this part of the prayer, remember we prayed, God, your kingdom, your will, your God, you're on the throne. Whatever you say, that's what I'm submitted to. So where is it for you? God, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven in my life. Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.